Uh, greetings, everybody. This is going to be part two of the uh, soldiers. This is just the introduction. DJ, you did, made a really good um, comment yesterday, and I decided to make a part two of this. Uh, but he mentioned, uh, when he hears the phrase, soldiers in Christ, it reminded him of Luke 9, take up your cross. So let's take a look at Matthew 10, verse 37, Matthew 16, 24, and Mark 8, 34. Uh, and he said to them all, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whosoever shall save his life shall lose it, but whosoever will lose his life for my sake, the same shall save it. For what is a man advantaged, advantaged if he gain the whole world and lose himself or be cast away? For whosoever shall be ashamed of me and of my words, of him shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he shall come in his own glory and in his Father's and of his holy angels." So if there's holy angels, you know full well there's unholy angels. Verse 27. But I tell you of a truth that there shall be some standing here which shall not taste of death till they see the kingdom of God. It truly is a spiritual war, the will of God versus the will of man. And I think uh, that was Luke 9, by the way. Luke 9, 23, I think. So, DJ, it was your fault. But, you know. I'm just saying. Thank you very much for that comment. I appreciate it. All right. Uh, this is the introduction. Let's get started with the, the message. Greetings, everybody. Chaplain Bob Walker here. Light of the World Ministries. In John 8, 12, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Uh, well, last Bible study I did was soldiers or soldier, this Bible study is going to be on army or armies. But before we do that, let me read a couple of things for you. This is from the, um, the story of Jesus. Uh, let's see, his name is the Robert Harris Evangelistic Association out of Asheville, North Carolina. I was driving a truck cross country and picked up one of his little, uh, I don't know, it's like a little 8 by 12 paper folded in half. It's got some interesting stuff on it. So let's read a couple things first. The great task of the church is to take uh, is to get sinners into heaven and saints out of bed. It says, do not forget that people will size you up by your actions, not your intentions. Now, here's a quote by Martin Luther. None can believe how powerful prayer is and what it is able to affect, but those who have learned it by experience. Now here's something interesting. Author unknown. To be called a brick. A brick is made of clay. So is man. A brick is square and plumb and true. So a man ought to be. A brick is useless unless it has been through the fire. So is man. My note here. Remember, we're going to be tried by fire. Remember that. Uh, a brick is not so showy as marble, but it is more useful. Man is not made for show but for service. A brick, a brick fulfills its purpose only by becoming a part of something greater than itself. The same is true of a man. When a man fulfills this description, he has a right to be called 
a brick. And remember that uh, Christ is to be the cornerstone and the foundation. That's my little note. All right, so this is going to be on the armies. Now, I heard it said that when somebody enlists in the military, now, I was in the U.S. Army, but when you, uh, when you enlist in the Army and you put up your right hand and you promise to uphold the Constitution against all enemies, foreign and domestic, basically, the soldier is handing the government a blank check to be cashed up to and including his life. Now, in case you don't know it, Christ is a king. Now, I, I hope I don't have to prove that from Scripture. If I do, you need to, you need to, you need to read the Bible. But uh, Christ is a king. And every kingdom, uh, every king has a kingdom, and every kingdom has laws, and every kingdom has an army. And at one time or another, I can't think of one kingdom that never had a war. And even, there was even a war in heaven, but we're going to cover that shortly. I don't think this is going to be a long study, so. All right, go to the King James Bible Online.org or Google the Blue Letter Bible. And you can read this, you know, online with me if you wish, you know, or you can get out your Bible and pause and, you know, look it up. Um, I apologize, I'm just not very computer literate in some things. Some, you know, some things I'm good with, but uh, learning how to do audio type stuff is just beyond me. All right, Exodus chapter 15 and verse 3. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. Did you catch that? Oh, wait a minute, but, but God loves everybody. Really? So God's going to have a war against uh, people that he loves? He loves everybody? Really? The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. Huh. Second Chronicles, chapter 25 and verse 7. But there came a man of God to him, saying, O king, let not the army of Israel go with thee. O king, let not the army of Israel go with thee. See, God's people Israel were to be an army, the Lord's army, the king. For the Lord is not with Israel, to wit, with all the children of Ephraim. Now, if you want to, you can read this whole chapter. You know, I have people occasionally say that I'm pulling verses out of context. But I'm just showing you that the Lord has an army in heaven and in earth. And his people are called to be soldiers in that army. But you would never know it from uh, the way the churches are. So, Daniel 4.35 and all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. And he doeth according to his will in the army of heaven. 
in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth, and none can stay his hand or say unto him, What doest thou? Well, you can say, you know, what do you think you're doing, Lord? But, you know, uh, it's not going to change anything. You can say that all you want, but you're not going to be able to stop him from doing what he wants to do. Joel, chapter 2, verse 11. Yeah, I know, I'm jumping around. And the Lord shall utter his voice before his army for the lord shall utter his voice before his army for his camp is very great for he is strong that executeth his word for the day of the lord is great and very terrible and who can abide it all right let's take a look at exodus chapter 6 and verse 26 now remember moses and aaron took Israel out of Egypt, okay? All right, it says, These are that Aaron and Moses, to whom the Lord said, Bring out the children of Israel from the land of Egypt according to their armies. Bring out the children of Israel from the land of Egypt according to their armies. Israel was called an armies. The, the 12 tribes were called armies. Exodus 12, 51. And it came to pass the selfsame day that the Lord did bring the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt by their armies. Wow, are we starting to get the idea here? Now, in Numbers 1 in verse 3, what was the draft age in the army of the Lord? Well, it says from 20 years old and upward, all that are able to go forth to war in Israel, thou and Aaron shall number them by their armies. No, they didn't have any 18-year-olds. You had to be 20 years old to be in the army. Now, if you really want to see how the armies were set up, I would suggest you read Numbers chapter 2. I'm only going to read a short excerpt. The, uh, the way the camp of the Lord for the 12 tribes were set up, there were three tribes to the north, three tribes to the east, three tribes to the west, three tribes to the south. They were set up in a plus sign or a cross. Did you know that? Uh, do you know that the furniture in the tabernacle was set up in a cross? I didn't know that either until I um, I was at a truck stop and uh, there was a company called Choice Books. They were uh, selling Christian books. Uh, perhaps you've seen them. If you go to the airport, some of the airports sell their stuff, truck stops. And they used to have, you know, cheap paperback books for travelers and stuff. You know, their books were generally three, four, five dollars, you know, reasonable. And had a book on the tabernacle. And I was surprised. I was like, wow, I didn't know that. The tabernacle. The furniture in the tabernacle was in the shape of a cross. And who are the people that hate the cross? Uh, people like the Jehovah's Witnesses and the you know who's. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, if you're not sure about a doctrine, look up those that are against that particular doctrine, and then you'll know if that doctrine's true or not. Yeah, generally, not always, doesn't always work out, but, uh, you know, if all the enemies of Christ are on a certain side of an issue, that's probably the wrong place to be. You know, like abortion and sodomite marriages. All right, Armies of Numbers chapter 2 and verse 7. We're just going to read a short excerpt. Then the tribe of Zebulun, now Zebulun was one of the 12 tribes. Uh, then the tribe of Zebulun and Eliab, the son of Helon, shall be captain of the children of Zebulun. 
and his host, and those that were numbered thereof were fifty and seven thousand and four hundred. All that were numbered in the camp of Judah were an hundred thousand and fourscore thousand and six thousand and four hundred throughout their armies. These shall first set forth. Just the tribe of Judah back in these days were a hundred thousand, a hundred, one hundred and eighty six thousand plus men of 20 years old and upwards. That was just the tribe of Judah. This was in the days of Moses and Aaron. You know, do the multi multiplication here. Uh, verse 10. On the south side shall be the standard of the camp of Reuben, according to their armies, and the captain of the children of Reuben shall be Eli Elizer, the son of Shedur, uh, Reuben was the firstborn son of Leah, if I remember correctly. He was actually the firstborn, if my memory serves me correctly. All right, let's go to Numbers 2.22. Then the tribe of Benjamin and the captain, the captain, that's a rank in an army, and the captain of the sons of Benjamin shall be Abidan, the son of Gideonai, and his host, and those that were numbered of him were thirty and five thousand and four hundred. All that were numbered of the camp of Ephraim were an hundred thousand and eight thousand and hundred throughout their armies, and they shall go forward in the third rank. The standard of the camp of Dan shall be on the north side by their armies, and the captain of the children of Dan shall be Ahia Ezer, the son of Amishadai, I guess, something like that. I probably should have taken Hebrew in Bible college, but I don't know. I didn't do it. All right, let's go. Oh, listen, um, you know, King David, we're going to talk about King David here. David was said to be a man after God's own heart. Now, David did some bad things, you know, Bathsheba, you know, but uh, he did some good things. And overall, you know, the Bible says that David was a man after God's own heart. Why? Because he, he knew the promises of God and he believed the promises of God. And he was eager, eager to go fulfill them. You know, everybody else was looking at Goliath and all these giants, the Philistines. They were scared to death. And David's like, wait a minute, guys. God promised us this land. Let's go get it. This is great stuff. Let's come on. Let's go. Let's do this. And everybody else is like, man, that guy's 12 foot tall. He's going to mop the floor with us. You know, that's the kind of attitude. They they were afraid. They didn't trust the Lord. David did. David did, absolutely. All right, so in 1 Samuel 17, 26. Now, we're not going to read all of David because I'm, I'm kind of tired. Oh, and this is uh, September 1, 2020. And David... Uh, okay, First Samuel seventeen twenty six. And David spake to the man that stood by him, saying, What shall be done to the man that killeth this Philistine, and taketh away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine, that he should defy the armies, that he should defy the armies of the living God? And then they told him, Oh yeah, well, you know, um, this guy's uh, anybody that kills this. Um, Goliath, his family is going to be exempt from taxes, and uh, Saul, the king, the king of Israel, is going to give him his daughter to wife. I mean, you know, how would you like to be son-in-law to the king? I mean, really? Can you imagine being son-in-law to the king? And uh, I'm sure his daughter was, you know, 
very attractive, you know. That's what guys go for, right? That's what we go for. But uh, that didn't work out too good for David. Saul was uh, kind of an Indian giver. He was jealous of David because he knew that he had messed up and that the Lord had rejected Saul, King Saul, not, not Saul who became Paul the prophet, I mean uh, the apostle. But, uh, and then Saul chased David around and tried to kill him. And then uh, eventually the Lord took care of that problem and made David king. So it's always good to be on the Lord's good side, you know, being obedient. And what really did it against Saul was uh, when he fooled around with the witch at Endor. You know, the Lord said to kill all the witches. Kill them. Get rid of all of them. Now, I don't know how many of you remember Elizabeth Montgomery in the, uh, the TV show Bewitched in the 60s. And um, what was her mother's name? Oh, Endora. Oh, yeah. You know, these, these TV people, they know exactly what they're doing. They know exactly what they're doing. All right, so what shall be done to the man that killeth the, this Philistine and taketh away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? Well, let's see. Uh, your, your family is going to be uh, exempt from taxes, no IRS, and you get the king's daughter. Huh. That sounds like a heck of a deal. So then in 1 Samuel 17, and skip to verse 45, David's uh, standing before the Philistine, and he says, Then said David to the Philistine, Thou comest to me with a sword, and with a spear, and with a shield. But I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel. But I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied. Oh, yeah. And I think you know the rest of the story. Uh, the Philistine, um, he got stoned. No, he didn't get a nickel bag. Sorry. First Samuel... 16 and verse 18. Then answered one of the servants and said, Behold, I have seen a son of Jesse the Bethlehemite. Now, Jesse was David's father. Bethlehemite. Bethlehem. Okay? Where was Christ born? Bethlehem. But Jesus wasn't called a Bethlehemite. He was called Jesus of Na uh, Nazareth because that's where he lived. Jesus of Galilee, that's where he lived. So sometimes people were called by where they lived. Like Ruth, she lived in the land of Moab. So she was called a, Moab, a Moabite. And uh, I think Simon, I think, oh, I don't remember if it was Simon, but one of the apostles was called a Canaanite. Well, guess what? He lived in the land of Canaan. Do I think he was one of the Canaanites, one of their uh, polluted DNA things? No, I don't think so. God said to exterminate the Canaanites. Sadly, very few people teach that anymore. So, what can I tell you? I have seen a son of Jesse the Bethlehemite. That is cunning and playing, and a mighty valiant man, and a man of war, and prudent in matters, and a comely person, and the Lord is with him. And the Lord is with him. The most important part right there. You see, Saul was uh, being uh, tormented by an evil spirit. The Lord had sent an evil spirit to torment Saul. So Saul wanted a... Um, somebody to play for him 
music. And I guess, you know, when you're a shepherd uh, and you're watching the flocks, well, what else have you got to do? Play a music instrument and uh, practice with your sling, right? I mean, what else are you going to do for however many hours you're out in the field, you know, watching the sheep? A shepherd. What was Christ? A shepherd. You know, I did a uh, at least one Bible study on King David, a type of Christ, contrasting and comparison, doing comparisons, comparing and comparisons of David with Christ. Uh, it's there's a lot of parallels there, and a few contrasts. You know. All right, so let's take a look. Let's go to the New Testament. Matthew chapter 22 and verse 1. Jesus is going to tell you a little parable. And Jesus answered and spake unto them again by parables, and said, The kingdom of heaven is like unto a certain king, which made a marriage for his son. Who's the king? God the Father. Who's the marriage for his son? Christ, the marriage supper of the Lamb, right? Verse 3, And sent forth his servants to call them that were bidden to the wedding, and they would not come. Remember, God, uh, Jesus came, and he called Judah, and he called Israel. Most people, they wouldn't accept Christ as the Messiah. They were bidden to the wedding, and they would not come. Again, he sent forth other servants, saying, Tell them which are bidden, Behold, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fatling are, are killed, and all things are ready. Come to the marriage. But they made light of it. They made jokes. They thought it was a big joke. But they made light of it. And went their way, one to his farm, another to his merchandise. And the remnant took his servants and entreated them spitefully and slew them. Who was his servants? The prophets. And later, the apostles. Of course, that hadn't happened yet, but the Lord sees the beginning from the end. But they made light of it and went their ways, one to his farm and another to his merchandise. And the remnant took his servants and entreated them spitefully and slew them. But when the king heard thereof, but when the king heard thereof, he was wroth. He was wroth. He was angry. He was P.O.'d. Oh, yeah. And he sent forth his armies. You see, the king has armies. And he sent forth his armies and destroyed those murderers and burned up their city. Remember, the earth is going to be destroyed with fire. You don't believe me? I got a playlist on that subject. Fire, people. Verse 8, Then said he to his servants, the king, The wedding is ready, but they which were bidden were not worthy. Go ye therefore into the highways, and as many as ye shall find bid to the marriage. Now I believe that the uh, first group was Judah. That the ones that, you know, slew the servants, because it says that Jerusalem killed the prophets. And then in Jeremiah 3.8, it says that Israel was divorced. But then in Jeremiah 31.31, 31, it says that the Lord said he would make a new covenant with the house of Judah and the house of Israel. And the Bible says that he went to Judah first, but Judah wouldn't have it, the great majority. I mean, there was a, you know, a remnant. Let's face it, there was a remnant. 
But then Israel, whose capital was Samaria, a lot of them received it with gladness and joy. You know, the people of Judah were resting on their, their works and their rituals and their traditions. Israel knew they were lost. Let's face it. Then said, his, then said he to his servants, The wedding is ready, but they which were bidden were not worthy. Go ye therefore into the highways, and as many as ye shall find, bid to the marriage. But those servants went out into the highways and gathered together all as many as they found, both bad and good, and the wedding was furnished with guests, bad and good. Yeah. And uh, I would have been one of those bad ones. I was the black sheep of the family, people. Let me tell you something. Verse 11. <laughs> I love this. And when the king came in to see the guests, he saw there a man which had not on a wedding garment. Well, if you listen to yesterday's Bible study on soldiers... The wedding garment is our righteousness with our faith in Christ. That's our garment. And when the king came in to see the guests, he saw there a man which had not on a wedding garment. And he said unto him, Friend, how camest thou in hither not having a wedding garment? And he was speechless. He didn't know what to say. What couldn't you what can you say? This guy didn't have the blood of Christ. Then said the king to the servants, Bind him hand and foot, and take him away, and cast him into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. Huh. All right, let's go back to the Old Testament. Exodus 15.3. Now, I know we read this, but I want to say it again. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. Now, to all those people that say, well, you know, that was the Old Testament. God loves everybody now. You know, today, just today, I had somebody that came to my channel and they liked some of the content and they said, yeah, you know, give me a call. I'll have you on my whatever, I don't know, show or something. I don't know. And then he took a look at Genesis chapter 6 and says, oh, man, you're one of those guys. Uh, if you don't know that, it was the uh, why God destroyed the earth and the flood with the giants you know, like the Philistines. Um, you know, some of these people actually believe, when you read Genesis 6, it said the sons of God married the daughters of men, which means uh, to them that the sons of God were godly men, but then the daughters of, uh, the sons of God were godly men, but then the daughters of men were ungodly women. So you had all the men were believers, but all the women were unbelievers. And then they got married, and they had children that were giants. And they really, they believed this. And then God said, kill them all. Well, he wiped them out in the flood. But I mean, after the flood, because the Bible says that there was giants in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God went in under the daughters of men. Of course, they won't look at Job 38 to tell you what the sons of God were, the angels. You know, they won't look at that. But, you know, really? So all the men were godly, but all the women were ungodly. And then the godly men married those ungodly women and then had children that were giants. And then God says, kill them all. Does that make sense? But that's what they believe. You know, and guess what? Esau married 
some of these Canaanites. Now, not all the Canaanites were giants. But uh, he married two Hittite women. And he had a grandson named Amalek. Uh, this is not a study on Amalek. So just I'm just giving you a little background. If you challenge me and say, Bob, I think you're full of it. Prove it to me. I'll be happy to, you know. But, you know, sometimes I'm up late, late, late at night because I got people living in the house here. And uh, it's the only time I could find quiet time to do these Bible studies. Uh, I guess I need to, well, I need to clean out one of my rooms and make an office there and shut the door so I can do Bible studies. You know, but... Uh, trying to do what I can, you know, but uh, they they saw that I actually believe that the sons of God of Job 38 are fallen angels, and they didn't like that, so they, you know, withdrew their offer, whatever, you know, if you want to believe all the men were godly and all the women were ungodly, and then they, you know, they got married and had giants for kids, and then God said exterminate them all, I don't know what to tell you, you know, really. But just know that Esau became Edom. He married into the Hittites, which were a Canaanite tribe, along with the Philistines. And he had his grandson named Amalek. So let's read about Amalek. Exodus 17 and verse 16. Chapter 17 and verse 16. For he said, because the Lord hath sworn, because the Lord hath sworn that the Lord will have war, W-A-R, war with Amalek from generation to generation. For he said, because the Lord hath sworn that the Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. What does that mean, generation to generation? It doesn't sound like there's ever an end. Well, there will be an end. Deuteronomy 25 and verse 19. Therefore it shall be when the Lord thy God hath given thee rest from all thine enemies round about in the land which the Lord thy God hath given thee for an inheritance to possess it, that thou shalt, that thou shalt blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven, thou shalt not forget it that thou shalt blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven, thou shalt not forget it. Now, that, uh, does that sound like um, Amalek's going to be offered salvation? I don't think so. Oh, but God changed his mind in the New Testament. I don't think so. Read Malachi 1. All these people that, that you know, uh, think salvation's for everybody. They can't stand Malachi chapter 1, where it says God hated Esau. So what they'll do is they'll say, well, you know, God loves everybody. And then when you show them that, they say, well, God loves everybody except for Esau. But it doesn't say just Esau. It says his heritage. And the Bible says a man's heritage is his children. He said he would lay his heritage waste for the dragons of the wilderness. Read Malachi 1. Don't take my word for it. You know, I mean, that's some pretty strong language. King Herod, according to Josephus, a Jewish historian that lived in during the Roman time of Christ, said that Herod was an of Esau Edom. And when Pilate uh, when the uh, you-know-whos arrested Christ and tried him and uh, sentenced him to death, brought him to Pilate, and when Pilate heard that Jesus was of Galilee, he says, oh, good, I know how to solve this problem. I don't want to have anything to do with this guy. So he sent him to Herod. And Herod was glad to see Jesus. You know, he wanted to see a magic show. So guess what Jesus said to uh, Her King Herod? You know, the, the family that killed all the children in Bethlehem from, what was it, two years old or three years old and under? Yeah, that Herod, that family. 
What did Jesus say to Herod? Nothing. Not one word. Think about that. I don't think Jesus wanted Herod to be saved. But, hey, that's just my opinion. Anybody can prove me wrong, I'd be uh, happy to see it. All right. Now, did you know there was a war in heaven? That's recorded in Revelation chapter 12. Uh, well, people will tell you, oh, well, that's future. I don't think so. Revelation 12, verse 7. And there was, W-A-S, past tense. And there was, it doesn't say, and there will be, and there was war, war in heaven. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels, and prevailed not, neither was their place found any more in heaven. They got booted out of there. So, that's what I think. All right, let's get ready to close this Bible study out. We're going to turn to Revelation chapter 19. I guess we're going to read the whole chapter. And after these things, verse 1, And after these things I heard a great voice of much people in heaven saying, Alleluia, salvation and glory and honor and power unto the Lord our God. There's people in heaven. When people tell you that their soul sleep, uh, I don't think so. You know, there is a verse in the Bible in the Old Testament that says that the dead know nothing. I think that's referring to what's going on with their families, what's going on on earth. Uh, they don't know anything. But, you know, there's people in heaven with Christ. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. I read that somewhere. Yeah. And after these things, I heard a great voice of much people in heaven saying, Alleluia, salvation and glory and honor and power unto the Lord our God. For true and righteous are his judgments. For he hath judged the great whore, which did corrupt the earth with her fornication, and hath avenged the blood of his servants at her hand. And again they say, Alleluia, for her smoke rose up forever and ever. How long is that? Forever and ever. And the four and twenty elders and the four beasts fell down and worshipped God that sat on the throne, saying, Amen, Alleluia. And a voice came out of the throne, saying, Praise our God, all ye his servants, and ye that fear him, both small and great. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, and as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of mighty thundering, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Let us be glad and rejoice, and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife, and his wife, hath made herself ready. And that's what I'm trying to help you people, and myself, trust me. Uh, trying to get the wife ready. You know, the Lord wants us to give up our attachment to the earth the filth of this world to be a bride without spot or blemish which I covered that in the last study yeah you know it's just he wants his bride he, he wants his bride to be a virgin I mean you don't want to marry a whore you know all my friends in high schools that married uh how would I put it? Loose women. Um, every one of them ended up getting divorced. 
Every one of them. Every single one of them. Um, and all the girls that I knew in high school, uh, they've been married three, four, five times. Uh, first girl I ever had as a date or whatever, uh, from what I understand, she'd been married four times. And I didn't marry her. We just had a little ungodly fun. But uh, I heard she was married four times. But I did hear she became a Christian. And she married some kind of uh, like a pastor or something, which I hope is true. I hope it's true. If the Lord could save somebody like me, he could save virtually anybody. You, boy, I tell you what, when the Lord... Uh, the Lord lists all my sins. Uh, it's going to be a, it's going to be like an encyclopedia. He's probably going to need a couple of angels to help him carry all those books. Yeah. Verse seven. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife had made herself ready. Remember we read Jesus' parable about the king making the marriage for the son? This tides right into this, people. Verse 8. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the white, for the fine linen, is the righteousness of saints. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. And he saith unto me, Write, Blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said unto me, These are the true sayings of God. Now, you know what? Let me tell you a little secret. Now, I went to Bible college for six years. Got a master's degree. Okay? A Baptist Bible college that teaches the pre-trib rapture, dispensational theology, that old whole mess. They want you to believe that the pre-trib rapture happens before the, you know, uh, when, when hell on earth happens, the tr great tribulation that the church is out of here, we go up to heaven, they teach, and we're at the marriage supper of the Lamb while everybody else is being slaughtered on this earth, and all the unbelieving Jews are getting their heads chopped off. And guess what? They miss the marriage supper of the Lamb. They're dying for their faith, and we're up there um, cleaning our teeth with a toothpick when they're arriving. Yeah, that is that is basically what they teach. Uh, can you believe that? I mean, really. Those that died in the Great Tribulation, they teach, are going to miss the marriage supper of the Lamb. Or they'll come in in the middle of it. I mean, really. They teach this stuff. I mean, they don't put it quite the way that I'm putting it. But that's exactly what they believe. And if you press them and point this out in one of their Bible studies with a lot of people... Uh, of course, they'll say, oh, well, brother, you're not rightly dividing the, the word of truth here. But then if you keep pressing it, uh, you know what? You're, you're going to have to leave. You're, you're causing people to think. We can't have people thinking. Just believe what we tell you. Yeah. And he said unto me, Right, blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said unto me, These are the true sayings of God. No, people, until the last saint gets their head cut off at the end of the tribulation, that's when we're going to be caught up in the air to be with Christ in the air when he's returning with his armies to exterminate the wicked on the earth. Not before after at the end at the last trump the seventh trump not donald sorry verse 10 all right these are the true sayings of god and i fell 
at his feet to worship him. And he said unto me, See thou do it not. I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Wow, I could write a book on that. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Verse 11. And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. W-A-R. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. And his name is called the Word of God. And the armies, and the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, not a feather, not a tickle stick. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath, wrath of Almighty God. And he had on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Remember I told you Christ is a king? Well, here's your Bible proof. Verse 17, I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God, that ye may eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of captains. And what are captains? Captains are a rank in an army. This is the enemy army that ye may eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of captains and the flesh of mighty men and the flesh of horses and of all them that sit on them and the flesh of all men, both free and bond, both small and great. And I saw the beast, the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. You see, the Lord is a, a Lord of war, a God of a man of war. And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped his image. These were these both, these both were cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone. And the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, which sword proceedeth out of his mouth, and all the fowls were filled with their flesh. And that people is, uh, I read the book, this is how it pretty much ends. All right, well. This is Chaplain Bob Walker. All blessings, praise, glory, and honor to God the Father and His only begotten Son, Jesus, who is the Christ, the Lamb of God, slain from the foundation of the world. All blessings, praise, glory, and honor. In Jesus' name, amen.